So anyway, uh, and we were going to triple the size of the outfit. We, we had, at the time I was, uh, at that time, 1961, uh, we had 16 F-86 H models. And uh, I was in the engine shop doing engine work. And uh, we, we got this word that we're going to make the change. So I, uh, I immediately let it be known to the powers that be uh, that I wanted to uh, go to, to the flight engineer program. And um, that's what I did. So here's some uh, particular, I want to see my seven G model. Uh, it's actually kind of a clone of a B-50 bomber. It has the same wing and same engine, same landing gear. Uh, the empennage is pretty much the same except for a slightly taller vertical fin. Uh, but, uh, you know, the 150, 175,000 pound airplane, max weight, we never flew them uh, that heavy. Uh, typical mission for us, we were in the 150, 160,000 pound range. Uh, and uh, it's a very good airplane. An excellent instrument platform. It had excellent all-weather anti-icing capabilities and so on. It had, uh, had these four monster uh, R4260 59B engines. 28 cylinders, 3,500 brake horsepower, wet. Quite a machine. Flight controls were all cable operated with servo tabs. The rudder was hydraulically boosted, and believe me, it was like flying a truck. Okay? 28 volt DC electrical system uh, with uh, 115 volts for certain systems. Had a, a, a medium pressure hydraulic system. It was primarily an electric airplane. So the only thing that was hydraulically operated was the brakes, rudder boost, and uh, the rear steering. <clears throat> Very good anti-icing equipment. There were eight 20,000 BTU combustion heaters, three in each wing, two in the tail. Provided uh, hot air for leading edge the icing for the improvised and, and the wings. <clears throat> Landing gear was electrically operated, had a series wound motor for each brake gear, and it, it really worked. And once <laughs> in a while, the motor would shoot a shaft, and we had an excellent free fall system, and an emergency system always worked. <coughs> uh, the commercial version of the C97 was the Boeing 377, and then each of the airlines tried to operate the airplane, but never could operate it properly. It was too maintenance intensive. <clears throat> the R4360 engine, uh, you can see here, Pratt & Whitney started the design in November 1940. <clears throat> Prototype engine, 1941. <clears throat> Finally, flight tested in Boeing 2 and uh, some uh, semi production engines completed in Boeing 3. Uh, no World War II airplanes used the Boeing 360. It wasn't until post war. Boeing 360, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with those numbers, the piston displacement, 4,360. Inches. 28 cylinders, a single stage, so to speak, internal supercharger, plus an external turbo supercharger. Nose case, planetary ducking gear system, and a torque indicating system. Uh, we knew exactly how much horsepower that engine was developing by simply looking at the torque reader, okay? Unlike our general aviation engines, we absolutely no, have no idea, absolutely no idea how much horsepower the engine was producing. No way to tell. 
paid sonars on pipe cases. <coughs> the uh, rows were labeled A through D, uh, A being the rearmost bank, and A row being the fourthmost bank. One of the weak spots of the engine was the scavenge system. There was a scavenge pump engine driven located between each plant case session in series. So if one of those scavenge pumps failed, the engine crankcase would fill up with oil in less than a minute. Okay? It only happened to me once. <laughs> the accessory case, very large pressure carburetor, two generators, a conversion valve on the uh, carburetor, oil pump, hydraulic pump, and generator. I put this uh, photograph up here primarily to show you the exhaust system. And you can see the, uh, the headers here running down from the cylinders to this collector ring and the turbo supercharger folded on right here. And you can also see the spiral shape of the cylinders on the crankcase. We absolutely never had any heating problems with this thing. We had thermocouples, thermocouples on the uh, B and C rows, the rearmost bank of cylinders. Uh, the engine always cooled very nicely <clears throat> in flight. The picture of the nose case, planetary gear system, and, and this was part of the torque indicating systems here, these pistons here. When you applied uh, manifold pressure to the engine, uh, this, act this actually moved fore and aft, and the opposition oil pressure in these pistons here um, gave us our indication of torque on our instrument panel. <coughs> Steel crankcases and a single piece, piece crankshaft. There was a 32 gallon oil tank behind each engine and an additional 50 gallons of oil in a tank in the lower forward cargo compartment and the engineer could select any engine and refill the engine as necessary. Good engine would use about a gallon an hour. <laughs> I only ran out of oil one time. <laughs> And that's when I was delivering a, uh, an airplane to the bow yard down in Davis Mountain. And of course, um, the maintenance crew took all the good engines off the airplane and put all bad engines on. <laughs> and it was about a seven hour flight from Wilmington to uh, Tucson, used every drop of that 50 gallon oil tank. <laughs> the turbo system had its own separate oil system, a different different oil than the engine, there was much, uh, uh, much, much less viscosity, but the turbo oil tank was submerged inside the engine oil tank to keep it warm, okay? <coughs> the inboard engines had a 50 gallon tank, two 50 gallon tanks for anti-detonant injection fluid, okay? And as I said before, the outboard engine nacelles had three 20,000 20, BTU combustion heaters for wing anti-ice protection, and it was great. That airplane could handle a lot of ice, as long as the heaters were working. <coughs> Ratings under standard ice and conditions. Maximum takeoff wet using ADI. 3,500 brake horsepower, 247 pounds of torque pressure indicated, and or 60 inches of manifold pressure. So if it was a colder day than standard, you sub the throttles up until you got 247 pounds of torque, you knew you were getting 3,500 brake horsepower, and that's where you stopped, 
you did not overboot the engines. If you went up further, you would overboot the engines. That was bad news. Okay? It was hotter than standard. You just go right to 60 inches. And whatever torque pressure you got, that was the horsepower you got. Okay? <clears throat> Dry takeoff without ADI. And you could get two wet takeoffs from 100 gallons of ADI fluid. Okay? But you have to take off dry. You're limited to 3,250 brake horsepower, 230 pounds of torque, or 60 inches of mouth for pleasure. 2,700 RPM, and uh, we used 20 degrees spark advance, and uh, fuel flows were different. You can see the fuel flow, oops, sorry. The fuel flow wet was 2,500 pounds per hour. That's because the degreaser valve kicked in. Lean, the mixture is the best power fuel air ratio to get 3,500 brake horsepower. But dry fuel flow, fuel flow was 3,000 pounds per hour. You can only get 3,250. <coughs> Veto power, 198. 2550 RPM, climb power 187, and uh, perfect manifold pressure and so forth. Unisafe planetary system, about uh, one third the uh, engine RPM. It also included an integral torque meter and its initial advanced mechanism. We could go from 20 degrees to 30 degrees spark advance for cruise. But we always use 20 degrees, 20 degrees for takeoff, climb, and uh, meter power. The internal supercharge, oh, compressor ratio, oh, sorry. Compressor ratio, 6.71. The internal supercharger, about six times the crankshaft speed. Very good turbo, turbo supercharger system. Electronically controlled. And since it was a pressurized airplane, about 10% of the turbo output was bled off from each engine to pressurize the airplane. It's a picture of the internal supercharger. Right here, a centrifugal impeller. This was a fuel feed valve. There was a single line coming from the carburetor, meter fuel pressure, pressure to the fuel valve, and the, uh, the uh, uh, valve sprayed raw liquid fuel right into the throat of the impeller, and from there to the induction system to uh, feed all 28 cylinders. Carburetor, very large pressure carburetor. <coughs> ADI flow regulator for wet takeoffs and a derivative valve. We had four low tension scintilla magnetos on each engine. <coughs> 56 transformer coils, two located on each top of each cylinder uh, to uh, provide the high voltage necessary to fire the plugs. Okay, 56 plugs per engine. And of course you could uh, vary the magneto timing from either 20 to 20 or 30 degrees. Required 115, 145 performance on the fuel. This is a picture of a carburetor, not a very good one. Uh, Fuel entered the uh, carburetor here. Uh, this is a derivative valve over here. And on top of the blower case, and in between the carburetor and the blower case, there was a FOD screen, a very uh, wide mesh FOD screen, about a half inch mesh, quarter inch mesh, to prevent FOD from being ingested into the engine. Props of very large solid aluminum 
play for the Pelicans, about 16 feet in diameter. Thousand feet, full feathering and reversing uh, with pitch lock protection. Uh, if you overspread the engine to about 2800, the, the uh, hydraulics will nickel lock the, pro the prop pitch uh, change mechanism and you, could, you cannot overspeed the engine any, any more than that. <coughs> it did have these unfortunate uh, restricted ranges on the ground. On the ground you had the uh, restricted range between 1250 and 1650 and 2100 to 2650. In flight, no continuous operation between 2100 and 2350. Some of the airplanes that use 4360. Probably the C124 used no system. Here you see the Achilles heel of the engine. Too many moving parts. <laughs> okay? A lot of moving parts. Reciprocating rotating, you name it. About 18,000 of, uh, of the 4360 was uh, of various models were manufactured by Ford and Pratt Whitney. 4260 were model 59Bs used on the C-97. Here's my job, pre-flight, had to do all this stuff, deal with the weight and balance situation, review the main status, get the density altitude and the field atmospheric pressure, do complete aircraft, exterior, interior, and operational, Inspections, prepare takeoff and landing data cards. The takeoff and landing cards, we had very accurate charts from Pratt Whitney and Boeing. We could predict the engine power that was, that was going to be available uh, with the atmospheric condition pre prevailing. All of these speeds, you know, refusal speed, takeoff speed. So on and on both four engine and three engine, and the landing distance. The engineer started the engines, evaluated the systems as they came online, do the run up, comply with all those restricted RPM range problems, operated the aircraft and engine fuel systems. Established all power settings using the appropriate energy controls, operated the turbo superchargers, operated and monitored the pressurization system as well. The electric systems were my responsibility. Operate all the anti icing and cabin heaters, prop the ice, compute, establish, and manage engine cruise power requirements. Monitor the power settings during descent. We always maintained a positive pressure load on the master rod bearings. Never went below one inch per 100 RPM of, of uh, RPM, uh, manifold pressure and RPM. Do a proper shutdown, record the maintenance problem. This is the flight engineer's office. <laughs> The uh, main instrument panel here. Overhead panel was mostly circuit breakers. Uh, this panel was for starting engines, the mag switches, the electrical master switch. Uh, these were called gang bar switches uh, in case of an engine fire or a heater fire. You could uh, use all these switches in a single motion and shut down the engine, feather the engine, close the fuel valve, close the oil valve, and so on. You can barely see down here is the ignition analyzer. Uh, the analyzer was 
time to all 16 magnetos and 56 spark plugs to every engine. You could literally look at every spark plug, every magneto on the engine with that uh, analyzer, a very, very important tool. Where's the throttle? Say again? Where's the throttle? I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, up here, these were all the heater controls for the anti-icing heaters, property ice meter, pressurization controls, engine instruments here, uh, oil quantities, oil pressures, oil temperatures, torque meters, manifold pressure gauges, tachometers. These were temperatures mostly over here, oil temp, carburetor temp, and so on. Fuel sift, fuel gauges, fuel selector valves, boost pumps, generators over here, so on. This is the overhead panel. Uh, these are the mag switches here. This is the master switch for the electrical system. You could select either battery or APU with this switch. These were the starter buttons. The middle switch actually engaged the starter. This was ignition boost. This is the primer, had a solenoid operated primer. You started the engine using prime only. And of course, these other uh, fire switches and so forth here, down here. And here's the engineer's power controls. This was a sink lever. You could operate all four propellers through a synchronizing box with this one lever. These were the mixture controls, throttles, turbo supercharger lever with calibrating potentiometers on for each for each engine. These were the manual turbo switches. These were manual propeller switches if the sink box failed. Uh, I forget what this. Oh, these are the uh, ignition advance or retard switches here for either 20 or 30 degrees ignition. This was the uh, pilot set both on both sides here. This was the avionics. A rudder trim pilot throttles up here. We flew over, all over the world with one VOR and one ADF and a navigator. Celestial. Celestial, yeah. Uh, this is another picture looking forward from the engineer's seat. Uh, engineers, mixtures, throttles, turbos, turbo superchargers. The uh, avionics stuff here, radar, pretty primitive radar. The autopilot was up here. It was a three axis electrically controlled autopilot. You could hold the heading, and that's all. A couple, <laughs> years, a couple years into the air, flying the airplane, uh, we, uh, and we added altitude hold, and we thought we went, died and went to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, my duties, uh, operating the airplane the engines. This is the way we started the engines. Uh, did the four starting engines check, then went to the starting engines check. Sequence is three, four, two, one. And it was a little challenging to use both hands. One on those, the left hand on those three buttons and the right hand's operating the throttle mix control. So the first thing you did was select the engine to be started, uh, number three. Okay, you press the start button with the middle finger of your left hand. Upon the engine rotation of the co-pilot, the start counting blade rotation. And, uh, and this was so, uh, you know, a big engine, we could uh, check for a hydraulic block and also lubricate the engine and properties up from the rear bearing. Okay. At 20 blades, I rotated the mag switch to both. We pressed the ignition boost and prime switches, okay, while holding the starter switch depressed. 
When the engine fired, number three follow, follow was slowly advanced with the right hand. Start and ignition boost switches were released. The engine was stabilized at a thousand RPM on prime only and throttle position. And at this point, use the right hand to take the mixture control out of auto cutoff. Do with all the rift. When 100 RPM drop was observed, that, mean, that meant the carburetor was metering. You could release the prime switch and the engine would self-sustain. <clears throat> Things to be avoided. Forgetting to turn the mag switch off. <laughs> Prematurely releasing the start button. And positioning the throttle too far open, resulting in the dreaded backfire. And I did them all. <laughs> at least once and a picture of the overhead panel again with the mag switches here starter buttons and so on okay valve plugs were a real problem could be a problem we used fine wire platinum plugs but the way we avoided that was when the engines were all running took all four mixtures and pulled them back and then manually leaned every mixture control to at least 20 to 40 RPM below best power. I went a little farther than that usually. I went use 50 to 100. And if you did this religiously, you would not foul any plugs, believe me. But you had to do it religiously. You just could not forget those particles. In addition, uh, you're on the ground waiting for ATC clearance. Every, every 10 minutes, the engine would, engines would run up the fuel barometric in full rich, of course, you know, to burn out the plugs, get them hot and all that sort of thing. The turbo superchargers, likewise, uh, you would close the waste gauge for one minute at 1,000 RPM to make sure the turbos were oiled and lubricated properly. And you get at least 40 degrees centigrade oil temp before you could uh, advance the throttles beyond 1200 RPM. Here's what we did on run up. Got into position, locked the brakes. The pilot took the throttles. Uh, the co pilot opened the gate, lift the throttles up, push them back over the gate, uh, and the props would go into reverse. And that was to simply make sure that all the reverse and, and unreverse systems were working. <coughs> Okay, and and then what did I do? Was the wrong it advanced one more. Yeah. Okay. Okay. After that reverse check was accomplished, with the mixtures in full rich, you take all the engines and run them up to uh, 1850, get them all squared away, exercise the prop using the sink lever from full increase to full decrease, and uh, uh, and then. Uh, Pull them back to a thousand RPM when that was accomplished. Then you would evaluate each engine, engine individually by starting with number one, taking up the fuel barometric pressure. The RPM had to be within a certain range, 2025 plus or minus 75. And this verified that the propeller was properly indexed uh, to the engine. You verify all the specific engine instruments, check the left and right mags, go back to 1,000 RPM, lean the mixtures, and then go to the next engine. Normal wet and dry takeoff, do the before takeoff check. Here were the important things on the before takeoff checklist. You're gonna make an ADI wet takeoff the ADI system had to be armed with a single switch. <coughs> What's the ADI for? Is that like a dry towel? Or? It's water. <coughs> it's water and a little alcohol. Oh. Isopropyl alcohol. The only reason the alcohol is there is so the water doesn't freeze. Okay, <coughs> okay normal takeoff. Reach the takeoff and landing data. Do a lineup check. The important thing on the line of check is you had to pull the cow flaps down to it no more than three inches. 
the cow flaps would open up in the book to eight inches, and we had an instrument to tell us how far the cow flaps were open or closed. The problem with this was if you attempted to fly the airplane or take off with more than three inches of cow flap, it disrupted the airflow over the empennage to such a degree that you may lose control of the airplane. Okay? And we used to demonstrate that when we were training. You just do in flight, take one engine and open the cow flaps to about five inches, and you would be amazed how much uh, turbulence was, was uh, generated. And uh, if you did that to all four engines, you'd be in big trouble. <coughs> okay. When we got in position, pilot started to throttle us up, called for max power. Engineer continued to advance the throttles and set the uh, appropriate power for weather drawing takeoff. Okay, and of course, like I said before, uh, we on a wet takeoff, we, we verified that the ADI system was functioning because at 45 inches, there was a manifold pressure switch that opened the ADI shutoff valve. The ADI flowed from the tanks to the ADI regulator to the derisement valve, and when it went through the derisement valve, the fuel flows decreased. And we verified that the only way you could verify that the ADI system was functional when you when you verified visually that the fuel flows decreased. And you know, like any other airplane, you maintain take off power until you clear all the obstacles and uh, get the appropriate speed and track the gear and the flaps. Pilot call for Mito power. The engineer reduced to Mito power, 2550 RPM and, and uh, 1898 pounds of torque or 50.5 inches of manifold pressure. The ADI system was turned off. And whenever, the, if the weather systems uh, required. I mean, if you were in freezing rain or snow, uh, the engineer would, 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 would bring in the turbos right away to keep the carburetor air temp up. Because that was the only source of carburetor heat on the engine. When we got the climb power at 155 knots, climb power was called for and the engineer set the climb power. And I suggested uh, the turbo system could be operated with a single lever. And typically, uh, if the weather was good, we, we didn't uh, start the turbos until we, we were at climb power. Intercoolers, a very large intercooler with an intercooler flap, you could maintain carburetor temp precisely. And we always ran carburetor temp at 20 degrees, period. Drifting controls were all rich. On the initial climb out, we always checked out the NEIC heaters to make sure, they, make sure they were functional and make sure the generators were parallel as well. Hopefully, we knew what the weight of the airplane was going to be at the top of the climb, and we used that and the density altitude to compute a cruise power setting initial cruise power setting, and uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, climb power was set until the cruise uh, airspeed was attained, and then the uh, power was reduced to the uh, calculated cruise power. We babied these engines. We always used uh, uh, 158 indicated pounds of torque for whatever RPM we choose, we, we use always 158 pounds of torque. And typically uh, at the top of the climb, we planned the climb, so at the top of the climb, we wouldn't have to use any more than 1,735 brake horsepower per engine to maintain a predicted airspeed. And if the weight for the airplane was right, and the density altitude was what you thought it would be, and you lean the engines properly, you 
can usually beat the choice by a nod or two. <clears throat> and every hour improves when you go back to Alder Ridge, you set a new power setting, bring a new game. And of course, we would go be using uh, 30 degrees of uh, quark advance at this time as well. Flight engineer told the pilot what the predicted airspeed should be. <coughs> set cruise power, stabilize the engine temperatures, and then proceeded to lean uh, the engines as, as required. This is the way we lean the engine. First thing he did was he looked at the manifold pressure chart for the altitude you're flying so you knew what the maximum manifold pressure would be. Did a scale on the analyzer of all four engines. Starting with number one, you would take the throttle, advance it to 109% of the base torque of 158, and that was 175 PSI, TPSI. Put the engine at 175 TPSI, take the mix control, lean it back to 158 again, use, mm, use the, uh, use the, uh, uh, Ignition advance switch to go from 20 to 30 degrees. Use the analyzer to verify that the timing had shifted. And then uh, retard, use the mixer control again to reestablish the 158 PSI of torque pressure. And after that was accomplished, you advance the throttle one inch of manifold pressure and then lean it back again. 258 pounds of torque. Finally, adjust the cow flaps and the intercooler flap to maintain the temperatures and repeat the procedure for the other three engines. <clears throat> Every hour, we would reset the engines with another cruise power setting. And in order to do that, you would slightly enrich the mixture control, reset the fork advance to 20 degrees, retard the throttle and the mixture control back to retain the 158 pounds of torque, and uh, you know, reset the new, new uh, brake horsepower for the next hour of cruise, and then reignite and lean the engines. We usually descended the airplane at cruise speed, uh, making sure that we maintained positive loads on the master rod bearings. Turbo superchargers were used according to the weather conditions and pressurization requirements. Engineer completed the new takeoff and landing data for the airport we're gonna land at. Approach and landing briefed. Gas turbine AP started, prop filter pull increase, part of the before landing checklist. And uh, normally we came down the ILS at about 120 knots with 33% flaps. Full flaps at the inner marker, touch down between 95 and 100 knots. Reverse thrust was used to slow the airplane to about 50 knots and then braking to slow the airplane further. No anti-skid brakes on this airplane, so you had to be a little careful. When we departed the runway, cow flaps were fully open to make sure we could cool the engines on the ground. Shut down the airplane with, by shutting out all the unnecessary systems, stabilize the engine temps, 1,000 RPM one minute to ensure efficient scavenging of the oil to minimize possible liquid locks. And over nine years that I operated the airplane, I had one liquid lock. My fault, because I did not follow that procedure one time. We had nine airplanes, an extremely dedicated and exceptional maintenance 
people to maintain the airplanes and the engines. Okay. Operating 36 of these big mechanical monster engines, things were going to happen. And, and we trained for that. We knew it was going to happen. And it was a good three engine airplane. Okay. <coughs> So many engine problems that I experienced personally. My first flight in the airplane, we had to the engine down. And I was, I was so green, I had no idea why. <laughs> I was a student, and uh, you know, my instructor engineer uh, recognized the problem and shut the engine down. <clears throat> Numerous cylinder failures. And you know, either a valve would come unglued or piston failure, and all that metal rattling around inside the combustion chamber would ping the spark plugs, electrodes, electrodes closed. So you could pick that up instantly on the ignition on that. Which cylinder it was. I had a few uh, few of those scavenge hunt failures. And the oil in 32 gallon oil tank would fill the engine up in less than a minute. You could see it, just the oil quantity in indicator on, on my panel. The gauge was just goes to zero. And of course, you had to shut the engine down. Several failures of internal problems of unknown origin. Two supercharger failures. One exhaust sack failure. Minor engine fire. Sorry. These things would only last about 1,200, 1,400 hours, and something would come unglued. You have to shut the engine down. I, as long as I ever flew with only one was an hour and a half. Two engine charts were pretty grim. Three engines were a problem. Two engines, a problem. <laughs> okay? And then there was a time <laughs> when the co-pilot retracted the landing gear, instead of reflight, we sent him flaps on the first of landing. And you want to hear that story? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> we started flying the airplane in 1962, and it took us two and a half years or so uh, to get up the strength in the uh, in the unit as far as personnel were concerned. We had 32 flight engineers, nine of us full time. Okay. We used to fly three local training flights every day, five days a week, three, three, three four hour training flights to train all of us for the sprints. Okay. So Oh, about 1965, I had, I had a thousand hours or more in the airplane. I was pretty comfortable with the airplane. And me and my friend, my dear friend Dick Harada, uh, other engineer, we, we caught the afternoon training flight. Okay? So we're out in the training, air, training area, and, and uh, we had a new student pilot, and we were going through all the drills, you know, shutting the engine down, restart the engine couple three engine approaches, four or five touch and goes, and, and all about an hour and a half into the flight, we get a call from base ops, come on, come on back to the airport, some people linking on the airplane. Okay. So we're back to the airport, and Greater Wilmington Airport was in Wilmington, Delaware. We land, I'm in the engineer seat, taxi in, shut down two engines, Open the door. Five guys come up in the co uh, come up in the cockpit. I had never seen them before in my life. And one guy says, "The unit is getting a no-notice operational inspection, and you're all getting a no-notice checkoff." Ooh, no big deal. I, you know, I'm pretty comfortable there. Huh? <laughs> so we crank up the engines, go back to the practice area, go through the drills. A couple engines shut down. Couple three engine approaches, couple touch and goes. Okay? 
these five guys, Air Force guys, real Air Force guys, they are all happy. We go back to the uh, airport, shut down two engines. They get off the airplane. We crank up the engines, go out, take off, and the next touch and go, we cracked up the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. My friend Dick Harada, he was flying the second half of the mission, so Dick was in the seat. I was just kind of standing there and watching things. And we're doing this touch and go. We did this hundreds of times, touch and goes, right? Hit down, touch down on the mains, lower the nose, reset the flaps and trim, max power and go, right? No big deal, right? Okay, so we make this first landing, touch and go, after all this no nose check ride stuff. Now it's nighttime, okay? We make the landing, touch down on the mains, okay? Touch, lower the nose, we're rolling down the 7,000 foot runway, and the pilot says, reset the flaps and trim, and I'm watching this, and the co-pilot, okay, the co-pilot goes to the landing gear. You have to lift the cover off the landing gear. You have to move the toggle switch, and you flip the gear switch to retract it, right? He did all three of those things in one motion, okay? The flap switch is way back here on the center console. The landing gear switch is way up here. I have absolutely no idea why he lift the gear switch up, right? Well, why did the gear come up? Did the squat switch prevent that? Well, <laughs> the crossing runway had recently been repaved. And we went over that little hump, and that was enough to offset the squat switch. And the next thing I hear is the warning horn starts blowing, the red lights come on, and all three of us in the cockpit, four of us in the cockpit, simultaneously said, oh shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the airplane settled down on its belly. You know, the prop blades are going everywhere. This odd awful noise sliding down the runway. I never thought the airplane was going to stop. <laughs> Honestly. We slide down the runway, and finally we come to this halt, and, and of course the first thing is get the hell out of the airplane. So we open the cockpit windows, throw out the ropes, and get out the airplane. Total the airplane. The double deck airplane, we squash the lower deck on the airplane right up to the cargo floor. Unfortunately, it didn't catch on fire. Okay. It's a little humorous, really. <laughs> if we go on, we do the check room, check ride, and then tighten the thing up. And then take off. <laughs> We're landing, right? You guys get in trouble? Uh, we had to go through the accident board thing. And here's what going. Here's what happened. We all went through the, and then, you know, the whole unit was getting this operational yeah. readiness inspection, right? Okay? Well, we went through the accident board, and what do you know? We're all combat qualified now. <laughs> <laughs> Next month, we started flying four trips a month to Vietnam. Oops. I was uh, 26.
down the arrow will go through quick and yeah. The down arrow? Yeah, yeah. lower right corner. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, that's it. I'm sorry I don't have my other photographs here because and, and I, this is my job. In 1965, I joined the chapter, the Union chapter in Wilmington, Delaware. And I met a guy by the name of Bill Davis, still a dear friend of mine, um, 1965. Bill and I bought an old derelict Taylor Craft, 1940. And we spent about six months uh, refurbishing the airplane and flew it to Rockford, Fort Yonkers then. And after about a couple of months, we decided we needed another project. So we started a pit special, an S1C. And I had a picture with Bill and I standing by this beautiful little pit special that we put together. It took us three years. Mm -hmm. And um, in the 68 years of my flying, Experiences. It still remains the most delightful airplane I have ever flown. And I'm sorry I don't have a picture. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> so, what did you have a backup flight engineer on these trips? There were two of us on all three okay. trips. Yeah. How much endurance did the plane have? How many hours? Endurance. Typical. Uh, we'll fly the Vietnam ten-hour legs. Wow. Yeah. So, what kind of cruise speed? Indicated 175 knots, maybe 200 through. We flew, we flew it from oh, 14 to 20,000 feet, depending on the weight. Yes, yes sir. Were the uh, later models where they put the uh, the pod of jet engines underneath? Yeah, they were only tankers. They oh. put the jets only on the tankers. Oh. Yeah. Yes, sir. Any hard landings? Did you collapse in Vietnam? Oh no. <laughs> you were prepared. <laughs> I did have one failure coming out of Saigon one night. That's the hour and a half I flew on the cruise okay. back to the Philippines. It was usually a 12 day trip from Wilmington to Vietnam and back. Uh, it was 18 days, I guess. We had an uh, engine change and the course of the trip. How much runway space do you need to land? How many runway? How much runway? Oh, you could you could very comfortably operate off seven thousand feet, okay. or less, some some little less, depending on the weight, weight of the airplane. Yeah. Is this the cockpit area pressurized or the whole? Seat? Oh no, the whole airplane. Oh wow. Yeah. So on your trips to Vietnam, what were you hauling? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was not my concern. <laughs> uh, you know. I don't, I don't know what we hold. <laughs> I can tell you when I was flying DCH for uh, Seaboard World Airlines, I had a trip to Vietnam. Flew over, flew 100,000 pounds of hand grenades over. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. 18 pallets of hand grenades. You know, I never thought a thing, thought a thing about it then, but holy mackerel. <laughs> 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 no smoking inside. <laughs> Cadillac for an airplane actually is really a research-powered airplane. I mean, pressurized, good anti-accident equipment. Uh, <laughs> I was just amazed it got off the ground. Uh, <laughs> one, one experience I relate, one, one of the terminal supercharging failures. Uh, we had, um, uh, it wasn't pictured on the install panel I, I showed you there, but we had um, turbo supercharger bearing temperature indicators. Okay, thermocouples on each uh, bearing shaft of all four turbos. And, uh, you know, 
They played singles quite well most of the time. And it was the only source of carburetor heat available for the engine. Okay? So you had to have those if uh, you were going to be flying in the weather to maintain 20 degrees centigrade uh, carburetor air temp. Well, we, we had a trip, domestic trip, one time from Wilmington down to San Antonio. And uh, I was the instructor engineer and had a student. He was doing most of the fall flying. I was just sitting there observing. And remember, there was a screen between the carburetor and the flow state, right? Okay. So we're going on, on our way, and somewhere about halfway through the flight, we got to penetrate a cold front. Just before we hit the cold front, I'm noticing turbo turbine, turbine, uh, turbine supercharger bearing temp on one turbo, you know, going up, right? So we, we watch it for a while. It finally gets into the caution range and is heading to the, uh, to the red range. And I said, okay, we got to shut this turbo down, right? So we just took the individual turbo switch, opened the wastegate, Shut the turbo down, push the throttle wide open, and pressed on, right? And everything was fine until we went through the cold front. They had some freezing rain and stuff like that. So I said, this is gonna be interesting. So I'm sitting there watching things, and we penetrate the cold front, go through all this freezing rain stuff. And I'm watching the instruments on the engine that we shut the turbo down on. And all of a sudden, the tachometer wavers a little bit on that engine, and the torque pressure goes to zero. So the engine shut down. It's just like in a windmill. Oil pressure's good. Fuel pressure's good. The prop governor maintained RPM. The only thing was that the torque pressure was zero. So we're just out there windmill, right? You know, I sit there looking at it. We lose about five knots of airspeed, and the pilot notices that. So he punches it off the autopilot, retrims the airplane, engages the autopilot. I'm sitting there looking at it. Ten more minutes, we lose five more knots of airspeed. <laughs> so I couldn't contain myself anymore after that. I said, well, we got a little bit of problem here. And what had happened was, that screen had iced over, okay? And there was no air flow going through the engine. That's why it shut down. So we just descended down to where the temp was above freezing, waited for about 10 minutes, restarted the engine, pressed on. <laughs> are the pilot's throttle controls active controls, or are they indicators for you on what power you want? I'm not quite sure on the this. throttles for the Correct. pilots. If you said there's dual controls and you set, you know, take off power or whatever, and right. you, then you adjust it and fine tune it. Or? No, the engineer had his own set of throttles. But who was so well, he's asking they, if it was like a polygraph on a ship? Where it no, was, oh no, I no. The engineer set the power. You know, the pilot started up with the power and called for max power, and the engineer pushed the throttles up to set max power. Yeah. Or the controls. Connected to yes. The yes, they were. Mm -hmm. Yes, they were. Cable connected. Mm -hmm. You had to be real careful about not over boosting your engine on takeoff, because that would serious problems would happen. We were talking about earlier about making all the adjustments during the course of the flight and all. Right. How much of a lag was there? Did, did you have to wait between the time you made the adjustments oh, no, was, and you was, got the. It was real time. It was instantaneous. Yeah, yeah it's pretty Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.